So once again, happy Friday. Uh, let's start like we normally do, short period of bell meditation. Please get into a nice meditation posture wherever you are behind your avatar. And as I ring the Ching bell, just focus on the sound of the bell. Just practice deep listening. Let's absorb some Dharma today. Uh, you're going to get distracted when it happens. Just gently remind yourself and go back to focusing on the sound of the bell. Then I'll do the three recitations and then on with the talk for today. I'll give you a moment, get into a nice posture. We begin at the sound of the bell. I go for refuge to the Buddha, the teacher. I go for refuge to the Dhamma, the teaching. I go for refuge to the Sangha, the taught. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dhamma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I have taken refuge in the Buddha. I have taken refuge in the Dhamma. I have taken refuge in the Sangha. Three pure precepts. Cease to do harm. Do only good. Do good for others. Bodhisattva vow. However innumerable all beings are, I vow to lead them all. However inexhaustible my delusions are, I vow to extinguish them all. However immeasurable the Dharma teachings are, I vow to master them all. However endless the Buddha's way is, I vow to follow it completely. Swaha. Still, there I am. All right. So as Jake's commented on the uh, the title of this particular talk is Buddhists wear clothes. <clears throat> Hope that's not a shock to you, but we do. Uh, there's a reason for this. Last on Monday we talked about diet, Buddhist diet, you know, carnivore, omnivore, herbivore. And, and I mentioned, you know, remember, keep your emotions in check. This, we're just talking about these things, right? And uh, so I want to go at this from a different direction today. Just a little different way maybe to think about it and to see how people react about it and get a gauge on how you react about this particular uh, 
conversation, if you will. So we're going to start out talking about a little bit about the second council, the second Buddhist council. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. This is the one that the awakened, the awakened one's disciples held in Vasali about 100 years or so after the Buddha's death. And it was at that particular uh, meeting that the schism occurred over rules in the Vinaya Pitaka, which were the rules for monastics. And the violations that they were all up in arms about, these are some of them. Uh, carrying salt in an animal horn, eating when the shadow of the sundial is two finger widths past noon, gathering food alms from two villages in order to have two meals, holding too many assemblies during the same observance period, making decisions for Sangha members without all members present, and then getting approval from them later, drinking milk after mealtime, drinking unfermented wine, citing someone did it before me as justification for not performing appropriate duties, using mats with a fringe, and accepting gold and silver. And these disagreements that arose over these violations were consequential in the division into the Theravada and the Mahayana sects, and plus some others too, the Vajrayana, for example. So think about those violations from a layperson's point of view. Some of them don't seem all that important, but they were. And today they continue to be. Uh, if we look at uh, eating when the shadow of the sundial is two finger widths past noon, there are many Buddhist traditions that the monastics do not eat after the noon hour. They can have something to drink, nothing to eat. So we have to ask a question of ourselves because remember we're heading into that Buddhism in the West thing, right? Will a schism for Buddhists in the West arise as the vegetarian omnivore debate, excuse me, debate resulting in meat and veg sects? So let me start that again. Will a schism for Buddhists in the West arise as the vegetarian omnivore debate? that could end up resulting in a meat and veg sect, right, rather than Theravada Mahayana. And I know it sounds silly, but it really doesn't sound that much silly when you consider how militant and dogmatic people can be on both sides of this conversation about diet. You can go to the comments sections of articles on diet on a variety of Buddhist websites. Go to the comments section, and you'll find that they're generally directed toward defending the commenter's point of view. And there's lots of talk about compassion, and specifically compassion for animals. Not so much about compassion for humans. Their need to defend is not helpful for anybody. But the talk about compassion, no matter how it's directed, is very important. So I want to give you some examples, and these happened years ago, probably seven years ago or more, uh, on the uh, EDIG website. And I had posted Buddhists Eat Meat, kind of what we talked about on Monday. And oh gosh, all kinds of comments. So I'm going to run through a few of them and, and talk about them. Here's the first one. This is an absurd realization. The Mahaparinirvana Sutra goes in depth that Sangha should not eat meat and that previous teachings were expedients. It also succinctly states that eating meat kills the great seed of compassion. Tour a factory farm and tell me. All right. Somebody that has opinion, right? This is, this is their commitment, and we got to respect that. But... I would like you guys, if you're in the mood, go out and find translations of the Parinirvana Sutta, uh, the Death of the Buddha Sutta, and find this section that says, in depth, Buddhists should not eat meat, and uh, that eating meat kills the great seed of compassion. Uh, I will tell you that in 1874, uh, in translations, the very first translations, 
uh, there was a word Sakra Madhava, the Pali word, Sakra Madhava. And in 1874, they translated it as boar, right? The big wild pig that runs around in the forests of Germany, I know for sure. Uh, and it has also been translated as pig's delight. And there has been a great deal of speculation as to what this meal actually consisted of. You know, some say it was a pork dish, and it very well could have been. It was very possible it could have been. And others believe it was some sort of mushroom, i.e. this idea of pig's delight, you know, a pig digging for mushrooms. Uh, but in all instances, in all the different sutras, the Buddha's death was caused by food poisoning. It wasn't the food itself, it was the fact that the food had gone bad. So, it gets brought up here that it's referring to the Mahayana Sutra and not the one in the Pali Canon, and that's exactly my point. Thank you. Is what is being referred to is something that was written many, many years after the death of the Buddha. But we have to respect the fact that that's somebody's commitment. Right? We don't downplay it. We don't insult it. We don't see it as any lesser than our own commitment. It's just we have to decide where that commitment arises from. But to say unequivocally that a certain sutra says a certain thing is hard to do because of translations. So we go on. Here's another one. There is always a lot of mental gymnastics by Buddhists who eat meat to justify it. It is an attachment. Let it go. All right? That's also legitimate. <clears throat> In a way, it is an attachment, right? Uh, commitments can sometimes be attachments, by the way. But isn't what this person is also saying their own attachment? So in these responses, in these comments, you can see not only the, the commitment of the person who's writing it, but possibly even the maturity of their Buddhist practice. <clears throat> because attachment goes a lot of different ways. Then there's this one. Blowing on the meat. I don't think it's the animal's karma you should be worried about. Oh, by the way, they're, they're using a lot of exclamation points here. Uh, if you give so little care to an animal's suffering that you think, Blowing on the meat is going to appease your participation in his murder by eating his corpse, then you're completely and ridiculously in denial. Why not try bowing to the animals with respect for a change? Seriously, 1,000 excuses to continue eating flesh, but not one reason to honor life. All right, again, very, uh, very vocal commitment very almost aggressive and dramatic. Uh, the use of the word murder here is meant to, uh, to elicit certain emotions in us, right? To bring it up, to bring animals to the same level as human beings. And again, for some people, that's a legitimate view. But it's not everybody's view. And by the way, he also didn't read the article very well because I don't recall uh, not giving a reason to honor life. We always give a reason to honor life. And then the last one that I have here, the argument that a vegetarian causes just as much harm in eating vegetables is totally bogus. But it's the standard response. I've kept trying to ask the basic question. If refraining from meat reduces the suffering of other sentient beings, shouldn't we refrain? All I ever get in response is weak rationalization. Even the leadership of Shambhala, meat eaters of course, don't have the guts to address this issue. Sad for sure, but we all travel our own path. So here's a person that has a commitment, but at the end of their statement, they also um, recognize or accept the commitments of others, at least a little bit in the end. Now, are they right? Refraining from uh, meat reduces suffering of other sentient beings? He's got a point, right? 
You can't say that that doesn't have some value. But again, it all comes down to choice, like we talked about on Monday. It also comes down to culture, time, and context. We talk about these things often. So there are two statements that are made pretty often, and these are seemingly done with the intent to shame an omnivorous Buddhist, one who eats meat and veg. One is that in this contemporary society, it is easier to be a vegan or a vegetarian because there are more choices and access to information. The other, that animals suffer greatly on factory farms, with the subtext being that one who is omnivorous is less compassionate. Neither is a truth in all situations. They might be a fact in certain situations, but not always a truth. It's not easier for a lot of us to be vegan or vegetarian. It costs more money, number one. But we do have access to information and we do have choices choices that we have to make. But the overall intent of the lesson of Buddhist eat meat <clears throat> was not so readers would question the choices of other Buddhists, which we talked about on Monday, but it was offered so that readers would question their own practice and their own choices and their own reactions to difficult subjects. There is a need to engage rigorous self-honesty rather than engaging in judging the views and actions of others. So that article was meant for folks to look within their own choices, their own attitudes, their own emotional reactions, their own wise responses. We hope there was a bunch of those. But in almost every instance, it was the comments were to in some way, shape, or form, defend their own view or attack the view of another. There are other aspects of human, human existence that require the same level of scrutiny that people give to their dietary choices. Choosing what clothes to buy and wear is an example. Here we go with Buddhist wear clothes. Finally, we get there. But others include things like what car you're going to drive, how much you're going to drive it, how are you going to limit your carbon footprint, what livelihood or livelihood are you going to engage in. These are also things that we have to make. We have to scrutinize and make choices. Every choice made has a causal consequence. It's going to be wholesome or it's going to be unwholesome. Every Buddhist practitioner has got to apply rigorous self-honesty in order to make pragmatic choices. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're going to talk about Buddhist wear clothes. Here's some questions. I just want you to think about these. You don't have to answer them out loud. Um, but this is the kind of scrutiny that we need to apply. Here's the first question. How aware are you of the clothes you wear? From the underwear to the hat, there are choices to be made. So you have to ask yourself questions. Where were my clothes manufactured? You look at the tag, right? Find that out, hopefully. Uh, how were the raw materials sourced? Who are the people and other sentient beings involved in the manufacturing, delivering, and selling process? What are the conditions those people live and work in? What are they being paid? What impact does the purchasing of your clothes have on the suffering of others? How much energy, effort, and awareness do you apply to your choice of clothes? And how compassionate is your choice? I know if you remember on, on Monday I mentioned about you know, somebody saying that they're a vegetarian or a vegan, and then you say, well, uh, what about that leather belt or leather shoes or, you know, whatever, the leather seats in your Mercedes, whatever it may be. But my intent here is not to single out omnivores or herbivores in the Buddhist community. It's not the point. The intent is to use the issue to offer that wholesome intentions and acts of compassion 
arise in different ways. And that equanimity or balance should always be in favor of promoting compassion and human flourishing. The choice you make, that should be the direction, that should be the intent. Because every item we purchase and every item we consume has its wholesome and unwholesome aspects. If you ask those questions about everything, food, clothes, car, house, ask those kind of questions. Um, the candy bar you buy at 7-Eleven, <clears throat> all your different groceries. I mean, think about asking those questions. Because many American companies, for example, they outsource their manufacturing to places where wages can be well below subsistence level where working conditions can be way below, I wrote here American standards, but let's just face it, standards of humanity. Uh, and places where child labor is legal, i.e. some of the tennis shoes that make it back into the US. <clears throat> Excuse me. And not to focus on only the unwholesome, because there are a lot of American companies that strive to do what is right to the extent that they are able. And we give them credit for that. We should. There are choices between low-cost products manufactured under conditions of suffering and higher-cost products that meet certain standards. Or at least our own personal standards, if nothing else. Maybe we want to go with uh, tags that say USA, made in USA, for example, or we want ones that are imported through organizations that promote fair trade, for example. Again, a lot of questions to ask. A Buddhist practitioner has flaws and strengths like any other human being. We have commitments just like every other human being. The goal for a Buddhist in their practice, though, is to have equanimity, some balance. A balance, though, that's tipped more toward the wholesome than the unwholesome. No matter the choice that a practitioner makes, the intent must be to always honor life in some way. So we can have the vegetarian um, omnivore debate. We can have that. We can talk about it. We can discuss it. We don't want it to divide us as Buddhists, though. We don't want that to be another schism that develops for Buddhists. And by looking at the other things that we consume and purchase and putting the same mindfulness and awareness into that, we begin to see that people have to make certain choices or they just choose to make. So we have to look after ourselves make the best decisions we can given our own circumstances with the intent that we are offering compassionate actions. Right? We're out there offering loving kindness. 